A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. And for listeners all around Australia, as I've found over many years now, doing these previews before various state elections, I've always found that those who are listening interstate, in states and territories all around Australia, the sorts of issues that are being faced at an election are the sorts of issues that are likely to be on the agenda in your state or territory too. So welcome along. It is an opportunity today to reflect on and to contrast the ethics and values of our biblical faith with the policies that are being put forward from all sides of the political divide and a focus on the state of Queensland. Stephen Miles is the incumbent Labour Premier in Queensland. Uh, He's seeking a fourth term. David Christofulli leads the opposition LNP, the Liberal National Party, who are poised to win back power for the first time since 2015. So a special presentation today on 2020, gleaning wisdom around the policies being put forward by the major parties. There are no holds barred, there are no favourites, so I might say a special welcome. We're going to kick off our commentary over this next couple of hours. Uh, Two first guests, Rob Norman, the ACL, Australian Christian Lobby State Director, is joining us. Hello Rob, welcome along. Hey Neil, it's great to be with you mate. And uh, one of our favourite commentators on this time slot each week, Bill Muhlenberg from Culture Watch. And uh, Bill, a special welcome to you. Great to be here. Uh, Bill, just let me start with you for a few moments. Uh, Bill, we've seen elections come and go. Uh, We've been watching a deterioration of the morals and values that are in our parliaments. I wonder if you've got any reflection as we get a conversation underway what Queenslanders are facing in the context of where we are as a nation. Yeah, well, as you say, we've done many of these uh, election uh, interviews in the past, uh, I think, 35 years worth. I've been involved in these kind of things. And, uh, well, look, there's a few quick, broad uh, things I tend to all specifics. But, you know, for the you know that at the end of not save party, a candidate will not save only. So he is our he is our Messiah. Having said that, politics does matters greatly for Christians as well. Those who think we can just pray and read the Bible and leave politics to somebody else, well, it's going to have an impact on all of us for good or ill, and that includes things like uh, religious freedom, uh, how our children are treated, whether in schools, by the media, and so on. So what happens in Queensland is part of what happens in Australia, and that's in turn part of what's happening in the world. And Christians are called to be global citizens. We're called to have a, a view to seeing the Lordship of Christ extend to every area of life. So that's important uh, here in uh, the Queensland election, and it's important that we're prayed up, we're informed, we're carefully considering how we might vote, and uh, it's hoped that everyone listening is doing just that. And I might say, Bill, even though you are based in Victoria, you're a part of the team that puts together the Australian uh, Christian Values Checklist, and uh, there's yep. a team of uh, of people right around the nation who've contributed to that. It's that one-page checklist with lots of green ticks, red crosses and question marks. Uh, I'll come back to you in just a few moments. Rob Norman, the Queensland State Director for the Australian Christian Lobby, with me in the studio. And Rob, I wonder if you can give us some sort of impression, the sorts of things you're hearing on the ground, uh, whether you're in the corridors of power in the Queensland Parliament House uh, or whether it's been out uh, visiting and talking with people, where are people at? Was there a mood that we can talk about? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Look, I think uh, this election has shown me again, yet again, that the Christian constituency is uh, among the smartest of all the voters. In other words, we are the people that are doing research. We're the people that are looking at the issues. Um, we're not leaving those issues till the last minute. And I've been very encouraged by the number of hits that we've had on our website, uh, the amount of research people are doing, and the intelligence that they're expressing in terms of uh, how they will vote. So mostly people aren't looking at uh, at the two majors in terms of, will I vote Labor or Liberal? 
they're more looking at their local candidates. They're doing their homework. They're asking them the tough questions. They're doing the research. Uh, if it's a sitting MP, they're studying their voting records. And these are all really important things. And so uh, we want that. We want Christians to be leading, obviously, in all areas of, of society. Uh, and so I'm very happy with the way things are going in this campaign in terms of uh, people of faith engaging in, in those issues. Uh, is it, Bill Muhlenberg, the thought here around uh, members who are elected to our parliaments representing a constituency in their communities, but somehow or other we've become this very Americanized and uh, given your American roots here, Americanized presidential style campaigns, and we've got a lot of focus on the Premier and the opposition leader, but what about those local members? Uh, how do you see things in a democracy with the way we have here in the state of Queensland and throughout Australia? Yeah, well, focusing on local members is key, of course. Uh, they may well have different views on different things. However, having said that, we have to bear in mind that certainly for the major parties and certainly for Labour, right, uh, what Cabinet decides will be the position is what the members are expected to run with. So in a sense, there's not all that much freedom uh, to deviate from what the party machine has said, this is how we're going to vote. Sure, on some small occasions, on key issues, there might be a conscience vote, maybe on abortion, things like that. But unlike in America, where often, you, well, you might have a conservative Democrat or a liberal Republican, right, kind of uh, shifting out of their own boundaries. Here, it's a little bit more proscribed. So while you do want to get to know your local candidate, by the way, take them out for a cup of coffee, have a chat with them, see where they're at, how they might vote on things. We also are aware that, at least, again, for the main parties, uh, kind of party solidarity is a pretty big deal as well. So there's only so much room to move, even if you do have, say, a good Christian or pro-life, lib, national, labor uh, man or woman running. Let's talk about the issues and uh, we'll start with some of those issues that are economic issues, but the sorts of things that resonate with voters around the state of Queensland and uh, bring all of the Australian listeners into this youth crime. It's becoming significant. Uh, health issues, ramping at hospitals where you're taken to hospital in an ambulance and uh, you're treated in the ambulance rather than in the hospital. Uh, housing issues, uh, cost of living pressures. Uh, coming to you, Rob Norman. Uh, are these the sorts of things people are talking about? Because we'll often like to talk about the social issues, but are people dominating their thinking talking about these sorts of issues? Yeah, look, they certainly are. And um, look, the, uh, the news poll that came out this morning, I think, or yesterday, shows that particularly that the number one issue is, is economics. People just can't afford to put bread and butter on the table. So these will always be the issues that, uh, that come back to bite political parties, I think, uh, the LNP have recognised that here in Queensland with this small target policy. Now, that has drawn criticism as well because uh, they haven't strayed from that target, so they haven't gone outside of that. And interestingly, Neil, um, abortion is there in the top six. And so people are talking about this issue. It's been very cleverly raised, I think, by uh, the Labor Party. And uh, it is an issue. People are talking about it. I don't think it's as clear cut as what they're saying. Um some of the polls that are being uh, quoted, I don't believe. I, I think they're wrong. We know that 75% of Queenslanders are against uh, late-term abortion, for instance. That hasn't been mentioned. Uh, staying with you here for a moment, Rob, because the abortion issue has been elevated, as you say, into the top six issues. And uh, we might even give some credit for that to Robbie Catter. Now, the Catter's party has three seats in the state of Queensland. And they may well be uh, a party holding a balance of power if things are closer than are forecast. Uh, how important is Robbie Catter in the mix here? Well, these minor parties, um, you, they can't be written off. And in, in the advent of a, um, a power-sharing arrangement, a minority government, they obviously come to the fore. So the Catters have, as you say, three part, three seats. They picked up an extra one. They adopted Morani, so they actually have four going into the election. And the speculation is, based on internal polling and so forth, that there could be two Townsville seats that uh, go to the Catters. There may well be the seat of Cook that could go as well. Now, if that all happened, 
you're looking at a minor party, uh, and when you say minor, use a little m, uh, you've got a minor party with potentially seven seats going into the parliament. Now, I don't think they will pick all of those seats up, but nonetheless, there will be influence coming from the crossbench, particularly as the election tightens. Bill Muhlenberg, you've been a part of the research that's gone on to produce the Australian Christian Values Checklist. Uh, that Catters Party has lots of green ticks in all of those columns around the social issues. As you're looking on as an observer from the outside and having researched this, uh, where do you think the Catters might fit? They could even be the holders of a balance of power if there's a hung parliament. Yeah, well, they could well, and uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, Our latest checklist for Queensland, 20 questions, many on economics, uh, youth crime and so on, then many on the kind of the moral, cultural issues, abortion, uh, marriage and family, the sexualization of children. So we have six parties all up ranked uh, conveniently by color, so you can kind of see who's the best in terms of Christian values. Family First actually ends up with the perfect score, but very closely uh, followed by Catter's Party and then One Nation, and then the three main parties after that. So yeah, in terms of things that most of your listeners would be quite concerned about, they're doing very well indeed in what they believe, what they're proposing. Uh, So it's hoped indeed they get uh, or retain some of their seats. And who knows, I think even 59 candidates are running with family first, even if we get one or two there, uh, perhaps. So again, Christians need to pray. They need to be serious about this election. And uh, well, by God's grace, uh, we can see some good results come uh, Saturday night. Rob Norman, I'm intrigued by your assessment that Christian voters are actually much more intelligent about the issues than people who are not identifying as Christian. And it may be because there are documents like that, Australian Christian Values Checklist. And let me just point to, because something very important for listeners today, if you take away something from a conversation that exposes some of these issues, it's where do I find more detail? How can I, at a glance, understand what's happening in the electorates around the state? The uh, Australian Christian Lobby has been developing all sorts of wonderful resources for uh, for Christian believers in particular to be able to assess and to be able to uh, you know uh, discern what's going on. Uh, what's on your site, uh, Rob? That that listeners can really glean good uh, information from today. Yeah, Neil, we've um, we've raised five big issues that we see as being important going into the election, particularly for Christians. Uh, religious freedom is obviously one of those. Gender ideology has uh, has been a big in the last 10 years, basically. Uh, the issue of decaying parental rights, and when you think about parental rights, feeds directly into the youth crime issues because it's the fundamental problem that parents have been disarmed in terms of how they raise their children. Sanctity of life issues, we've seen Robbie Catter's uh, live births bill come up, and also the, the bigger discussion around Australia on... Uh, third trimester abortion. So that's big for us. And we've also raised the issue of prostitution reform. Of course, Queensland now having the most uh, radical decriminalisation laws in the country. So all those are important. We have ranked them. We've, uh, we've surveyed. We've sent out candidate for- forms to all candidates. And we've had over 100 replies, which has been unprecedented in, on, our, um, on these kinds of websites. Um, and we've also ranked politicians in terms of their voting records. So qldvotes.org.au has a heap of information. Uh, these websites get really well developed and they become redundant, obviously, tomorrow. But it's been a bit of a wild journey over the three months developing that website. All right. So there are wonderful resources available for Christian believers uh, to be able to see the contrast of where your Christian values sit and where the major parties and even candidates are getting down into the uh, the even, you know, getting a little bit forensic in the way that the candidates actually believe uh, issues around policy. Hey, I've got an issue here that may even be a little bit of breaking news. And uh, I've got you gentlemen here. I'm going to put you on the spot. The conversion therapy laws that have been passing in all of those governments all around Australia are creating a real issue right now. And I want to get your impressions about what follows, uh, depending on an outcome in tomorrow's election for the state of Queensland. Because in Victoria, and I'll come to you first of all in just a moment, Bill Muhlenberg, putting you on the spot here. 
Victoria has a very big challenge. The Anglican Diocese of Melbourne uh, is on uh, on a, a very well uh, reputational source, forcing paid and volunteer workers, this is in the Anglican Church, uh, to commit to complying with the Victorian State Labor Government's Change or Suppression Conversions Practices Prohibition Act, in other words, conversion therapy laws meaning that if anyone comes into contact with a child seeking gender transition, they must affirm and assist as per the law. Now, right now, as I understand it, people in the Anglican Church, and this is not a criticism of the Anglican Church as much as it is uh, asking your impression about government and church, church and state issue here, people are signing to keep their jobs and ministries And uh, the question is, what do we do when a secular, humanist, neo-Marxist, hostile government crosses the line and starts telling the church what we may believe and what we may uh, understand about compliance with the state? I'm not sure if you're up on that, Bill Muhlenberg, but this is uh, fairly breaking news and it looks like another church denomination Buckling under pressure here, this is what happens when the state takes this sort of under-the-thumb mentality of church. Any thoughts from you, Bill Muhlenberg? Yeah, well, two quick things, broad brush uh, remark. Uh, This has long been the case where denominations, churches, Christian institutions, schools, uh, even, you know, social uh, work type groups, parachurch groups, in order to keep on side with governments, especially if there's funding arrangements, right? Uh, too often, they will simply go along with whatever the state dictates simply because, well, if, uh, you know, they don't want to lose that funding uh, and they'll be willing to compromise to keep that money coming in. So I've long said, look, better to actually trust God, perhaps for the first time in your life, and let him uh, provide the uh, wherewithal to do what you're doing, then to let your hands be tied by government uh, positions that are clearly unbiblical. And uh, secondly, and quickly, this idea of well, conversion therapy, what's wrong with that? You know, the idea is we're going to have electric shock therapy for homosexuals. No, here in Victoria, it even includes such draconian things as you're not allowed to pray for somebody who says they want to, you know, reconsider their own sexual orientation. So it's that bad where Christians can't even pray. So it's a real worry indeed. And uh, yeah, we'll have to see how uh, these things pan out. Rob Norman, governments are following suit. We've noticed uh, that even, you know, we might even say in reflection under the leadership of a Dan Andrews in Victoria who led Victorians into uh, very, very difficult situations, uh, criminalising Christians and church leaders around issues to do with uh, transgender and uh, these issues around conversion therapy. Then other governments like Western Australia and Queensland followed suit. Is there any hope, if there was a change of government, uh, that an LNP might repeal or do something to wind back some of these things? From what I'm hearing, there's not a lot being said from the LNP of any sort of promises to repeal. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is this is legislative creep, and it began actually in Queensland. We we were the first state in Queensland to introduce uh, equality style laws, and so ours are the most mild, but they represented a beginning of the pushback. And of course, when you see uh, Victoria, the the laws there are just off the planet in terms of uh, you know um, the, the legal, the criminal side of it. So absolutely ridiculous. What we have seen and we've requested from the LNP particularly and both the majors but the LNP have responded to us is uh, they have uh, they've replied to us and they've said this quote the Anti-Discrimination Act of 1991 requires further reform and the LNP will consult extensively with the community and stakeholders to ensure all can live in a safe, respectful and peaceful Queensland end quote. Now, they were replying to us, to our questions, in terms of the Respect at Work bill that was just introduced and passed into the Parliament before the dissolving of the Parliament. Uh, now, that, as you know, Neil, that particular bill will become an act and it will be, it will be uh, law on the 1st of July next year. So it's going to take the Human Rights Commission that long to sort out the mess. Um, we are hopeful that the LNP will engage in a process that 
could repeal large parts of that before it actually becomes law. So there is some hope. We will be lobbying them strongly on that. We're going to hold them to that promise. And um, if they attain office tomorrow, uh, then that process will begin virtually from the first day in Parliament. And if we have the circumstance of a hung parliament and there's a catters party in the mix uh, or that may be even other independents or there is one one nation uh, uh, member in the state of Queensland at the present time, um, is there any hope that those who might be on a cross bench in Queensland would be on side with the thoughts of repeal because uh, with no commitment from the LNP, you might hope that if there is a hung parliament, that there is some sort of commitment coming from those who are on the cross bench. Is that a possibility? That is a possibility. I mean, the cross bench is always a bit of a mixed bag. So you've got uh, Greens and you, you'll have Catters. And as you ta- as you mentioned, there could be a, a one nation. It'll probably be James Ashby if he uh, is successful in the seat of Keppel. So it'll be an interesting situation. Uh, the Catter Australia Party has agreed to talk to us about a repeal of the uh, work, Respect at Work bill as well. Uh, they're happy to relook at that. So I think together with even a minority LNP or a, better still a majority LNP government, I think there is some hope that the worst parts of that act can be rewound. Now, it's a, it, this is a long march. We're going to have to reverse about face the march of the institutions and go back in the other direction. So it's a beginning point. It's not the end point. We must be vigilant. And as Bill uh, rightly mentioned, <clears throat> we have to be strong in this. Christians have to be courageous. And it may be that some people go to jail or are actually prosecuted under the current laws before we see change, but we certainly can't roll over on it. There needs to be a courage and there needs to be a strength and uh, we all take courage when we think about how we might vote in an election and state elections are very important. Bill Muhlenberg, we've got to lose you in just a few moments. Out of all of the 20 questions that are on the Australian Christian Values Checklist, is there one here that you would like listeners to check out before they cast their vote tomorrow? Well, in many ways, we think all 20 are key, but several questions, especially for children, whether it's the gender ideology, uh, taking away uh, parents' rights in terms of what they're exposed to in schools and so on. We have at least three or four questions. Number seven, oppose sexualization of children in schools. So all of those obviously should be a concern to any parent. In fact, even if you're not a parent, what they're doing to our children and getting away with including this idea of uh, trans kind of uh, affirmation without even notifying parents. That's a real worry, I think, for most ordinary Australians, most Queenslanders. So being aware of what uh, certainly Labour and the Greens are up to and sometimes Libs Nats a bit weak on, uh, that's a, a key issue all of us really need to keep our eyes on. Well, Bill Muhlenberg, I want to thank you so much for your insights and for listeners, christianvalues.org.au to check that Christian Values checklist. Uh, We've also mentioned the qldvotes.org.au website. That's the in-depth research from the Australian Christian Lobby where you can make a comparison to where your Christian values lie with what is on offer from all of the parties who are up for election in the Queensland state election. Bill Muhlenberg, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks again. Life, culture and current events from a biblical perspective. 2020 on Vision. And a special welcome along if you're just joining us, a special broadcast today, a preview on the eve of the Queensland state election and a series of guests who are joining us and Rob Norman, the ACL State Director for Queensland, remains with us. Uh, We've just farewelled Bill Muhlenberg, but I do want to welcome to our special coverage today Mrs Alex Todd, who's the Queensland Campaign Director for the Family First Party. Uh, Hello Alex, welcome. Hello, Neil. Thank you so much for having me. Alex, we haven't talked much about Family First. It did get a quick mention uh, when uh, one of our guests mentioned that there are 59 candidates for Family First that are standing in electorates all around the state. Um, Can you give us a little overall impression of the sorts of feedback you've been receiving? Uh, Is there a good response to Family First? Are people saying, oh, Family First, who are they? Or I remember when they used to be around. What's the impression you've been getting? 
Um, overall, Neil, it's been encouraging. Uh, you're right, there's been a gap. We, we weren't around for the last couple of election cycles and we're rebranded and relaunched um, over the whole nation. But this is our first Queensland election as Family First Mark II. Um, people uh, are looking to see what we stand for and asking, asking good questions. We've been hearing that Family First on the Australian Christian Values Checklist uh, has really rated a hundred percent response. So Christian commentators and those who are interested in the morality and the ethics, what's going on, uh, they like Family First. Uh, is there something from your end here as a campaign director? Uh, what would your thoughts be for for Queensland voters who are listening to our conversation now to perhaps more seriously consider a party they haven't been hearing a lot from for a little while? Uh, absolutely, we. The, the, the party is founded on Judeo-Christian values, so it makes a lot of sense that we get a, a good score on the Christian values checklist. Um, everything that uh, those 20 questions cover are important foundational positions for Family First. Um, we believe that with that foundation, all the other decisions that our governments and, and leaders will make will be wiser and, and more um, better for our community as, as a whole. So... Um, we, we're we strong in those positions. I, I note on the values checklist there's some question marks and where other parties stand on different things. Um, we can assure voters that Family First will, will not budge on these particular issues and we build, want to build on those to then make um, recommendations, decisions and talk about other things that our community needs to talk about. Uh, now, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, there's some thought that a Family First not expecting to win a seat. Uh, perhaps uh, a miracle or two could be necessary there to get Family First across the line. But it's important for you to get a lot of ones in those ballot forms. Uh, what sort of difference will that make for listeners to our conversation today, for listeners who are concerned about those morals, those ethics, those Christian-founded, uh, Judeo-Christian-founded uh, values, uh, for those to actually be held more prominently in people's minds? Any thoughts here from you? Absolutely, Neil. Thank you for asking. Now, we we don't know. We honestly don't know what the outcome will be after tomorrow at 6 o'clock, but what Family First wants to do and has provided 59 candidates to do is to give voters the opportunity to communicate with their whoever whoever their member will be that the issues that we stand firm on and have our foundation built on do matter and we do want to have conversations around these issues. Um, if there's lots of um, misunderstanding, misconception or historical uh, understandable misunderstandings with voting in Queensland. We used to have an optional preferential system, but for the last few election cycles, it's been compulsory preferential, which means when um, a voter gives a minor party or an independent their, their number one vote, if that party isn't successful or that candidate isn't successful, the full value of that vote will be passed to their next preference. This means that Family First, while we don't know what our results are going to look like, the voters who choose to put us as their number one preference are communicating that there is a pr proportion of the community who want to have these conversations, um, even though their vote will then go on to support um, either whoever wins or whoever comes second in the two-party preferred system. So we want to give voters that opportunity. Uh, whether or not the outcome is a, a sitting member, we will wait to see. In the meantime, 59 electorates can vote. Rob Norman, um, there will be a, a Labor or an LNP Premier after tomorrow. Uh, what are you hearing on the ground around minor parties? Because some will say, well, and, and this is what the major parties say, don't waste your vote on a minor party. Um, what are your thoughts around that for people who might be confused as to whether there's value in voting for, say, a party like Family First or uh, Catters or uh, One Nation? I think, I think, Neil, that minor parties play a very important role. They actually educate the electorate. That's number one. And so, as Alex has rightly mentioned, the alignment of the values between the Family First organisations like the ACL and other Christian outfits uh, are quite tight. And so when people go to the polls, when Christian people go to the polls 
and they uh, preference a minor party. And I'm, I'm not suggesting people do that. I'm just cause we don't give advice on that. But if they do that, it has several positive effects. Firstly, it educates the, the government that's coming in. And so if, for instance, Family First were to poll uh, upwards of 2% of, of the state vote, that would be amazing. It would tell the incoming government that there is at least 2% of the electorate that care about those values. Now, secondly, the other thing that happens is that the number one vote will draw some electoral uh, funding, which is very important for minor parties to survive. And so um, if people are thinking about that, your first vote, if it goes to one of the minors, they will receive funding and your second vote may well then spill over to the major um, Labor or Liberal, depending on how you preference. And so it's very important. It communicates uh, the sentiment, the values of the electorate, and it allows Christians to have a say in terms of what they believe and how they should vote. Alex Todd, as Queensland Campaign Director for the Family First Party, uh, where have you been putting your resources? What sort of issues have been the prior the priorities for you? Uh, are these sort of uh, economic issues, uh, the social issues? Uh, where have you been looking uh, to put resources that will lift the uh, the image of Family First Party? So nationwide, we're trying to raise the profile of the the cost of living because that's on the top of the list for everyone. And our um, the rush to the renewable sector and the spending there without doing the maths is where we see uh, the implications of that is that the cost of everything, if, if the cost of energy goes up, the cost of everything goes up. And that's what everyone is is dealing with and struggling with. So that's that's one of the areas nationwide that we want to talk about. Um, the um, just trying to think in in Queensland we didn't expect that the abortion conversation would become the conversation for the campaign but of course life is important and um, Family First are a 100% pro-life party so the evidence that's come forward just recently on the Born Alive bill and has been presented um, in Queensland usually this is an invisible uh, an invisible issue but it's it's getting a voice at this point, and that's one that we're passionate about talking about. Um, the freedom for faith-based schools to employ and and teach their values is another enormous one that's nationwide, but also very important in Queensland. Um, and the gender, the in Queensland specifically, the gender ID laws. So Queensland decided um, not very long ago that you could decide you could change your birth certificate, um, change the facts on a legal document uh, every 12 months if you'd like. Um, that's something else that has compl- um, consequences that are impacting communities. Uh, lots of issues around integrity there. Uh, Rob Norman, when we hear about um, the Judeo-Christian-based party, uh, like a family first, they are just as interested in the economic issues as they are social issues. You have to be, because that falls into our Christian appreciation of what it is to be a good steward. We're not only interested in the social issues. Do you think that Christians need to be aware politically across not only the social issues, we talk about a lot on this program, uh, but these economic issues, they are of equal importance? Yeah, sure. Look, we're called to be good stewards of the planet, so we we should even have uh, environmental policies that were that are sustainable and healthy and so forth. And I think again, Alex has highlighted something that Lyle Shelton mentioned when I spoke to you recently that uh, that power power prices and, and power production are, are a massive issue that's been very understated during, throughout this election. And uh, parties like um, Family First have raised that. I know the Catters have raised it. One Nation have raised it. It seems that it's gone through to the wicket keeper with the major parties, but power prices, the whole question of of nuclear power is an important one, the ultimate green power, really, when you think about it. So those are all big issues, and again, Christians, again, I think have have shown incredible intelligence in doing their research on these, and some of the best ideas we're getting on power price uh, power policies are coming from parties like the Family First. Alex Todd as Queensland Campaign Director for Family First. Let me ask you, uh, will a poor result for Labor in the state of Queensland tomorrow 
mean anything federally? Uh, any thoughts here from you? Because uh, what happens in the States uh, already, uh, you know, no doubt the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition are preparing what sort of comments they might be uh, using, depending on the outcome of the Queensland election. Uh, what do you think a poor result for Labor might mean federally? Because that's what we're all led to believe is about to happen. I do not have a crystal ball, um, Neil. And of course, the impact of each election does flow on to to the next. I think largely based on the commentary that we're um, we're listening to in the media um, and elsewhere. I, I think voters. It would be great if every voter um, considered carefully the issues at, at each election, um, and that the waves of, of political popularity had less impact um, in the system. That would, be, that would be wonderful. This is 2020 with Neil Johnson, helping you make sense of life, culture and current events from a biblical perspective. 2020 on Vision. Great to have you along with us. A Friday edition of 2020, a special edition today with a preview to what is coming tomorrow as another state election is upon us. It's Queensland's turn for a state election. Uh, There is an incumbent Labor government there. Uh, The LNP is looking to arrest power away from Labor. It hasn't been a LNP uh, uh, government since about 2015. Uh, Guest in the studio, Rob Norman, is with us. He's the State Director for the Australian Christian Lobby. Alex Todd is Queensland Campaign Director for the Family First Party. And right now, uh, 2020's Andrew McLennan is actually in... Chinchilla in central Queensland and uh, with one of the candidates, a family first candidate that's standing in the seat of Warrigo. Uh, Andrew McLennan, welcome along to you. Yeah, great to be with you, Neil. And I'll tell you what, great to be here in Chinchilla. It's a beautiful town in uh, regional Queensland. And as you said, Neil, I think the people in the bush sometimes feel a little bit left behind in these elections. There's a real focus on the issues around the cities. So I've got uh, the Family First candidate for uh, Warrego with me, Chris Sheck, and I want to ask him what the people in the bush are concerned about. So, Chris, over to you. What are the things right now you're hearing on the ground that people in the bush are concerned about? Uh, Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, Now, you guys already hit on a couple of the others because we are concerned about the same things uh, that uh, city folk are concerned with when it comes to uh, rights around uh, the right to life um, and with electricity prices, particularly with net zero policies and all of that. We, of course, have a lot of our own concerns uh, on top of that as well. Uh, Warrego is the biggest electorate in Queensland. Um, and as such, we have um, more roads than any other electorate. We have a lot more stuff to cover, and and a lot of the uh, people out here are very concerned with the state of some of our roads, uh, some of the bridges which get flooded frequently. Um, we've been uh, told by a lot of farmers as well that there's a, a fairly big wild dog problem. Um, some of the fencing that needs to go up around that's a, a big issue. Uh, and then with farmers as well, um, they're constantly concerned. Uh, with the state of their farms and their ability to maintain their own properties. Um, And they feel like a lot of these things are are being attacked by um, green policies or or by the, you know, the people that are pushing them um, to try to control what they do on their own properties. Yeah. Yeah, now you, the Warrego is a huge seat. I think it's one of the biggest in Australia, isn't it? It goes, for, you know, all the way to the Northern Territory border uh, as far as Dolby in, in Queensland as well. But so you're saying that people feel this area is a little bit neglected by the current state government in the area of roads and infrastructure? Oh, most definitely. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's an intentional thing. We are an absolutely massive electorate um, and it takes a lot to maintain that. So um, I don't think the government's necessarily deliberately abandoning us, um, but there's always a, a matter of numbers involved with that. Um, and I think the more you support the country, uh, in a lot of ways, we are the lifeblood that uh, provides for the nation with, with our food industry and um, with everything that, that goes on with that. So uh, I think putting a little bit more money into that to help to support us would definitely benefit all Australians. Yeah, now you talked about farmers struggling. And again, Australia is a big country. We have an Australia-wide audience. So many of our listeners right now are in regional areas and elsewhere in Australia, other states. What When you talk about the, the regulation and, and the current government's policies and, and green policies, how does that affect the average farmer? What makes it difficult for farmers now? Uh, what I've heard from a lot of them is that um, being man- able to maintain your, your farmland is obviously 
very, very important. Like nobody knows how to look after a farm better than a farmer. Um, but these policies are being pushed by uh, the city folk that have never even stepped foot on a farm, um, don't know how to grow a single thing to save their lives. Um, so some, I guess, specific policies, uh, there are uh, quite a few revolving land clearing um, and just being able to maintain that land. Uh, farmers, like bushfires, is a really big problem out here, same with flooding. Um, and they really with the red tape to be able to get permission to be able to uh, cut out a bit of land, chop down some trees or, or do some controlled burns. Um, they're really quite handicapped when it comes to that. Um, same thing with a lot of the uh, the net zero policies, which they push as well. A lot of farmers uh, struggle to be able to get, you know, use proper fertilisers and stuff with the attack on methane um, that they're saying, you know, it destroys the environment and so it controls what type of fertilisers they're able to use. Um, not all of that is necessarily a problem here yet in Australia, um, but it is a problem overseas and it will be a problem here soon unless we put protections in to uh, protect and, and yeah, keep our farms safe. So it sounds like the Greens' influence on the current government here in Queensland is definitely having an impact in regional Queensland and on the ground that people are getting a bit fed up with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they have an impact on everything. Yeah. yeah. Neil, I'll cross to you guys in case you or your panel want to ask Chris some questions as well. Uh, yes, uh, anything from our panel, uh, Rob Norman or Alex Todd. You've probably got a few thoughts, uh, but it's your candidate. But let me come to let me come to uh, Rob here. What would you ask a candidate on the ground? Yeah, Chris, I think you raised some great points. Uh, Queensland is the most decentralised state in Australia. That's there's no doubt about that. And I think we've seen, um, particularly the LNP, move t- more towards the left to try and entertain inner city people to try and win electorates in the in the suburbs and largely they've I believe they've neglected the regions to a certain extent uh how do you, what what are your thoughts on that Chris what what's the feeling in the bush in terms of uh the way the LNP stacks up yeah well the focus for the LNP will always be on the cities because uh that's where the most voters are that's where the most funding is and that's where they'll get the most support um and they don't realize that by the, the outback, um, they're neglecting the people that really provide for the nation. Um, they might get the votes if they, they help the city folk, but they won't maintain the country long term if they abandon the, the country folk. Let me just come to Alex uh, Todd, who's the Queensland State uh, Campaign Director for Family First. Um, is this something that's coming on from regions everywhere? People have expressed some disappointment around uh, the way the big parties are focusing on the cities and uh, ignoring the bush, and perhaps that's uh, an exaggeration. But uh, let me just come to uh, the Queensland campaign director. Alex, your thoughts here? Yeah, Neil, I think that's that's true. And the conversation does come up every, just about every election, that the, um, the population bases in our cities um, are where the votes are won. So there, there are there's less of a voice from the regional and country areas, and uh, without a complete shakeup of our of our system, I'm not sure how we overcome that. Um, it, it's it's tricky, it's complicated. I do have a question for Chris, though. Is that an option? Yes. Yeah. So, Chris, I know. What about John? Um, well, just can you share with us the impact that the gender ideology and and other um, progressive uh, in, uh, teaching and and content and curriculum is having in schools in country areas. Is that something that country country voters are worried about? Um, I would say it's not as big an issue yet. Um, we can see it creeping on out here, um, and as a teacher, I've witnessed some of it myself. Um, but it's definitely not as big an issue. We haven't had any um, drag queen story times yet out in Dolby or, or further west that I'm aware of. Um, but I would like to protect our, our country to stop that from coming out here. Uh, a lot of the time people don't care about these things until it actually comes to their place and, and they have no idea what happens and then all of a sudden they wake up one day and the world's changed and they go, oh, why didn't I think about this earlier? So I would like to think about this now before it becomes an issue. So I don't think too many people are concerned with it yet, uh, but they will be unless we do something now to stop it. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I want to just say, as Andrew McLennan is in Chinchilla today, and uh, you've got about four speaking engagements, as I understand it, Andrew. So uh, I think just a, a word for those who are in those areas, Chinchilla and also in Dolby. I've got You've got some speaking engagements. I want to thank you, Andrew McLennan, for taking some time to uh, just introduce us to Chris Schenk, who's on the ground as a candidate there for Family First. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Yeah, great to be with you, Neil, and just great to be with the people out here in the bush. And we are going to Dolby after lunchtime today, speaking in a school there. We'll be in the uh, Christian Outreach Centre in Dolby tonight and the Lutheran Church in Dolby tomorrow morning for a men's breakfast. But uh, really is good to connect to our country cousins, our brothers and sisters. And um, great to meet you, Chris. I want to thank you so much. Alex in Twom. You choose some good-looking good looking rooster next to me. He looks good on a pub. Chris, Alex. <laughs> okay. There's a little bit of breaking up there, but uh, thanks so much to Chris and thanks so much to Andrew. And uh, always wonderful to have 2020 on the road, which we often do sometimes around uh, elections for previews like this. Alex Todd, uh, the quality of candidates. I mean, did we specially select this one? Uh, this Chris is uh, presenting pretty well. I think a lot of the listeners might be thinking uh, that's a guy who's got his finger on the pulse. Um, the quality of candidates, Have you, with your 59 across all those electorates, how have you been impressed with the quality of those who've come to the fore? Um, it's been uh, amazing, Neil. There's a number of people who came on board immediately when we put the call out to to see whether there would be pe- people willing to put their hand up as candidates for this election. Um, people who are passionate about seeing seeing things go a, a good direction for our whole community. Um, there's people of every age from almost every area of life we have um we have a couple of 19 year old candidates who um have passion and are keen to be an option we have an 82 or 84 i've forgotten 80 80 something year old candidate who is passionate about being the option for voters to vote with these values and everyone in between um from all sorts of backgrounds tradies educators business people uh uh, mums, dads, grandmas, great grandmas, grandparents. It's yeah, there's an amazing mix of our population uh, of all the different demographics and areas that people would come from, nurses, um, all sorts of places. And we've got an enormous age range. Um, also because you know we're talking to a Christian audience, there's people from just about every denomination um, involved in recognising the need to put their hand up and be involved in this space. Hey, Rob Norman, when you hear that people in regional centres, and there's a lot of people listening in regional centres, uh, very loyal to what Vision does and reaching out and it'd be 200 towns in Queensland uh, listening in today, um, when you hear that those people are not necessarily concerned with even the big economic issues and certainly some of these social and moral issues that we often will be talking about, but people in regional areas, they are interested in what's happening with wild dogs and uh, the state of farms, how green policies are affecting uh, all sorts of issues in the bush, uh, roads and infrastructure. This sort of thing really brings to the fore that it's not just people in capital cities that are very important in an election like this. Dead right. And that goes back to my, my first point, that we do have a large regional vote in Queensland. There, We have some large cities outside of uh, Brisbane, and we have some great communities out in the, in the regions as well. So I, I actually lived in Blackwater for 10 years. I know what it's like out there. And the key to, to those electorates out in the bush is the local member, the local candidate. And really, it, doesn't, it often doesn't matter which party they're in. So you'll often find an electorate where there's a strong independent that uh, once they gain power and, and they gain trust from the people, they actually uh, have a long tenure. Um, so I think that the regions definitely play a big part um, and I think more and more we're going to see that influence as as populations decentralise. About to break for news, and we're going to farewell Alex Todd and thank uh, you, Alex, for your contribution here. But before I let you go, just to mention familyfirstparty.org.au for listeners who want to know what a Judeo-Christian foundation in a political party looks like, you might be interested to check the policies of the Family First Party at familyfirstparty.org.au. 
To mention some of the other resources we have mentioned, the qldvotes.org.au website. Uh, There's a link there also on the acl.org.au website. The Australian Christian Lobby's extensive research into what the parties and even forensically what the candidates believe and how they voted. There's a lot of good information there to do some research. But also wanting to welcome two more guests. Mike Southon, who is the leader of Freedom for Faith. Mike, a special welcome along to you. Thanks for having me. And Dave Pello, the founder of the Church and State Summits, also joining us. Dave, a special welcome to you. Thank you, Neil. Always fun. Uh, Let me start with uh, general impressions, because uh, all three of you as guests know each other in some ways. You've got some overlapping in the way that you have been assessing uh, those things that are going down, not just in the state of Queensland, but nationally as well. Uh, I know uh, that Dave Pello, you did a tour recently with Rob Norman and right up through the electorates into the far north of the state. Uh, Dave, how did you find that experience? What were you hearing on the ground from voters and uh, what are you hearing right now? Well, it was uh, very much uh, the kind of content that you've covered this morning with uh, highlighting actually the the voters uh, listening really to us and, and what I was encouraged by was the uh, um, the diversity in the body of Christ, which is is really well united, um, it was a, a united kind of tour, and it was a united audience with uh, many uh, denominations um, hosting us: uh, Baptist and Pentecostal and Uniting Church uh, in in various places. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was really encouraging. But uh, what people uh, I guess really concerned about is the lack of moral conversations in the main, in the mainstream media, um, which are concerning us. It's the issues that you've talked about this morning, uh, religious freedom, uh, the sanctity of life, uh, parental rights, uh, gender confusion. You know, we have gross oppressions happening in this state, and neither of the major parties are willing to talk about them. Um, I guess the Labor Party is willing to talk about them and and be uh, shamelessly uh, heathen and god mocking, um, and the LNP runs for the hills lest they be cornered on having a conscience, uh, which which is bizarre because uh, we've seen the Catter Party, who who um, have a very clear stake in the ground on moral issues, uh, now trouncing the Liberal Party. In the uh, in the re- regional areas, this isn't a vote loser. Uh, and in the metropolitan areas, you've got members like the member for Ujuru, Mark Robinson, who has had a flag on the high ground of the sanctity of life for his entire career, and increased his electorate results um, despite focused campaigns against him by the radical left. This is a a wrong headed strategy from the LNP to uh, run, and we've seen David Crucifully, um rapidly erode the lead that he had a couple of months ago um, by reacting like a kangaroo in the headlights when uh, uh, he's confronted about a moral issue and asking, uh, do your members have a conscience? Mike Southon, the small target strategy, as Dave Pello says, the LNP running for the hills, not wanting to talk about these issues, uh, the small target strategy being something that they're seeing as a positive. If they don't put themselves into the spotlight, they might just fall over the line because the Labor Party uh, not performing so well and people, it's a little bit on the nose uh, of a lot of places in Queensland. What about this run for the hill strategy? Where are your thoughts here? I, I agree with Dave. It's I think I think it's a poor strategy for the Liberal Party to um, to follow. Um, but number of and on we were about school scripture. Ri uh, keeping scripture in school the way it's going and even strengthening it. And again, it was it's been very difficult to get a commitment from them saying that they will address this issue, that they will strengthen their policies. So um, they, they definitely have been um, 
uh, quiet, shall we say, on quite a number of issues that Christians would be considering uh, important. And I think that does weaken their ability to um, to attract Christian votes. Uh, Christian demographic swings far more than people think it might. And um, Labour always have an opportunity to win Christian votes with uh, economic policies that Christians would resonate with. Uh, and the Liberal Party needs to be fighting hard if they want to keep that Christian vote. Christian vote. Uh, Dave Pello, this has been something you have had a passion for now for many years. How do we understand the way Christians are thinking about politics and values and uh, even from church and state summits to uh, this tour that you did throughout all the electorates up into the North Queensland about getting Christians aware of the issues because there's been a significant ignorance? Yeah, look, uh, I have to smile when you say the way Christians think about issues because, uh, I mean, there's there's a vocal minority of Christians and there's a silent majority of Christians. And mm. the reason we do education tours and teaching conferences and the so forth is because there's a paucity of, of courageous teaching from the pulpits. Um, there's a paucity of intellectual curiosity from Christians to actually understand the issues. There's a disconnect between the the kingdom-centric, gospel-founded interest in the welfare of our neighbours uh, and Christians. They they so many Christians still don't get after the marriage postal survey after the votes on abortion and euthanasia and and uh, an absolute erosion over the last 10 years of the things we've taken for granted over the previous 100 years um and there's so many there's still a stark lack of of preaching of righteousness and justice uh and and an understanding of what god says about the issues that we're all debating um, I am encouraged, though. There is an increase. There is an awakening happening, and people are starting to preach repentance instead of just revival. And and so, you know, the way Christians think about these issues actually needs to become a thing uh, because it, it's not uniform. It's, it's patchy, um, and I'm encouraged by the increasing number of Christians who are, are saying, you know what, we can't stay silent anymore. We can't stay on the sidelines anymore. We we actually have to make representations to our local candidates uh, and try to make these an election issue where uh, the people are running away from them. Let me let me quote you a Bible verse here, and I want to hear from the two of you, Mike Southon from Freedom for Faith, uh, Dave Pello from Church and State Summits. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter eight, uh, 28, verse 13. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Uh, Mike Southon, so far as uh, Christians leading rather than following, where what are your thoughts around the sorts of things that we're called, uh, right even back to uh, Deuteronomy? Well, we are called to... Um with, which, with ever skills and gifts God has given us as individuals to be um, taking a lead in society. And, uh, and there are many areas that Christians are, are very active, but we have pulled back into a bit of a holy huddle, uh, particularly when it comes to politics. Uh, over the past 50 years, I, I can tell you, um, I studied at Moore Theological College down here in Sydney, the Sydney Anglican College, and 50 years ago, if you studied there, you would have been told you should join a political party. It's a very important element of being part of our society. Mm. These days, it is just inconceivable for a minister to be part of a party. And most Christians think, oh, you can't do that. You can't get involved in politics. You can't get involved in this area of our society that makes most of the major decisions for our nation. Mm. And so we've, we actually have pulled ourselves out of areas where we could be exercising godly leadership. I don't mean taking control, but having our voice heard, being involved uh, and, and showing true servant-hearted leadership 
Um, we can't do that if we're not in the space in the first place. So that's the first observation is we should be taking this sort of leadership, but um, we've walked away first. Somehow, rather, we've got a detachment between our Christian stewardship and responsibility and things that have impacted us, uh, things that sometimes uh, in an eschatological sense, uh, relinquishing some responsibility, uh, waiting for Jesus to come back any moment, uh, not bothering about being salt and light. Uh, There's a lot of things. There's a lot of different dimensions and factors, aren't there, Dave, when it comes to uh, the way we think about Christians and the way that they will uh, engage in the political sphere? There there are far too many factors and facets and strategies and and rumors that are uh, are published and and abound and I, I get a little bit frustrated by the people who um, present themselves at ex- as experts and and then give uh, these pronouncements on the silver bullet that will fix our, our politics and there just isn't one and what such people end up doing is frustrating those people who've just got interested just got involved and and they end up promoting a sense of futility instead of a sense of effectiveness and um, yeah we are called to be the head we are called to lead and and that's not a sense of control or domination um, that's a sense of service a sense of of the prophetic uh, conscience that the church should be, which is neither slave nor master, um, but informing those who make the decisions, which is not just the government, but the electorate as a whole. And this is the role that the preachers have in the pulpits, but it's also the role that the Christians have. It was all the followers, not just uh, the the five functions of the ascension gifts, um, but it was all followers of Jesus who were commanded to make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that Jesus commanded us. Uh, the, the better thing to do is to wind it back and have that confession and humility that King Solomon had at his inauguration to confess our ineptitude. Uh, Solomon said, I'm, I'm like a child who doesn't know where to come in or go out. I have no political orientation or sophistication. He said, God, give me the wisdom to rule this great nation of yours. That's a prayer that impressed God nearly more than any other prayer in the Bible. That's a great attitude for us to take. And then to pursue that knowledge, that wisdom uh, from our pulpits and from ministries like Freedom for Faith and the Australian Christian Lobby and, and so many others providing great insights, strategies and, and wisdom. We'll come back to some of the issues at hand uh, in just a few moments. But Mike Southon, uh, as Freedom for Faith uh, extends a lot of influence now in different places around the nation. Uh, you've held and been responsible for a whole bunch of Meet the Candidate forums. Can you tell us anything about what's happened in the state of Queensland as as people have gathered together and sometimes in churches and church facilities to be able to do these sorts of Meet the Candidate opportunities? The candidate opportunities. Yeah, it's been very exciting. And I should just say, my internet is at a high attack. Can you still hear me fine? Uh, we've got a little bit of a uh, break up. Sometimes uh, we might just we might just uh, keep keep going if you can. Uh, we'll see if this corrects itself. Keep going if you can. Uh, so, uh, I think we've lost Mike. Uh, we're going to get Mike back in just a few moments. Um, let me just come to you, Rob Norman. Uh, so far as Meet the Candidate forums, and it's something that the Australian Christian Lobby has had a long history in doing. You've got freedom for faith in the mix here too. Uh, no doubt there's no competition in all of that, but um, what have you noted about the freedom for faith gatherings and ones that you might have had yourself uh, with the ACL? Yeah, Mike's doing a fantastic job. We've we've actually promoted the freedom for faith uh Meet the candidate po- forums on our website, so we're really happy with the way that's going. I think uh, the fact that we've given power to the local churches to do these interviews is really, really good. It, it gets a level of engagement that perhaps we wouldn't be able to do as the ACL. So we've tended, Neil, to uh, to concentrate more on town hall style meetings. We had a an online webinar where we engaged people with some of the big issues, um, and these are these are more uh, tuned towards. Uh, issues and basically speaking to them. So we invited a bunch of experts to speak to some of the key areas we're looking at. Part of the the reason we do that is because um, we find that often when we um, try and invite MPs, they all make great promises and often don't uh, follow through with those. But Mike seems to be in the slot. He's got a great uh, amount of favour in that. 
He's connected him with the churches, and I know that that's happened here in Queensland as well. So it's been great to watch. Uh, I have been tuning in and listening listening to the ones that have been online as well. I think I've got you back now, Mike. Have we got you? I have. Sorry about that. Um, New South right. Wales doesn't want to talk to Queensland today. <laughs> hey, we've been talking about these Meet the Candidate forums. Have you got something you can reflect on the forums that you've held in various electorates around the state of Queensland? Has there been feedback that's come back? Have they been well supported? Uh, have there been candidates who've been put on the spot and challenged by some of these big issues we talk about? So interestingly, uh, the, the forums were very well supported by churches. Lots of churches wanted to run the forums. Uh, it was more difficult to get the candidates to decide to come. But we did get um, quite a number of candidates who said they were going to come. Uh, and then just at the last minute, quite a few of them decided to cancel. And it was actually LNP candidates who were starting to cancel on us in the last minute. Sure. That, was a, that was a strange dynamic. But we did run some uh, quite a lot of uh, quite successful forums, candidates from both sides, and the feedback from the candidates was they, they felt welcomed, they felt heard, but they were definitely challenged because they were given the opportunity to be asked the specific questions that Christians were caring about and give specific answers. Uh, in some cases, one or two candidates actually gave answers about abortion, uh, answers which then got quoted and have been used um, by the Labor Party at, um, in a disappointing way. But um, the forums have been very successful and a really good start to an ongoing pattern. We're praying that every election, the Churches of Queensland and the Churches of Australia will invite their candidates in just to ask them the hard questions of the day uh, in a loving and respectful way. Dave Pello, as I understand it, uh, LNP candidates have been instructed not to talk to the media, uh, really like a blanket ban, so that nobody oversteps the mark and creates something that uh, takes away the primary messages of the LNP. Um, that sort of counts the same for Christian candidates that we might have wanted to talk to. I know that you had an event just recently, uh, which was a political forum uh, politician free. Uh, give us your insights into what happened there. Well, a- again, uh, this is a teaching conference where we're not, uh, you know, asking opinion, uh, asking politicians for their opinion, and we're not really asking the audience for their opinion. We're saying this is the word of God. This is what God says about the issues of justice and righteousness, which are at stake in our in our electorate. It's the work of the pulpit to actually train and disciple Christians on how to be uh, the ministers. Um, that's exactly what Scripture says. It's it's the work of these gifts uh, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And and so, um, what the the theory behind it is that uh, you know when politicians have the courage to turn up to these events. They either self-select and don't come because they know they're not going to be able to answer the questions right, uh, or they they uh, spin, dodge, and deflect, um, and you know answer the question they wish they had been asked instead of the question they were asked on basic media training, especially for major party candidates, uh, and and then the people that most uh, I mean it, it's what they're very good for is advertising the minor party candidates who are willing to go on the record and say, I have a conscience and I'm willing to exercise my convictions if I should uh, be so blessed as, as to be elected to serve um, the, the electorate. But I think what it shows um, is that the church um, is no threat at all to the LNP. Uh, the coalition and David Crisofulli are uh, under the impression that they can spit on us totally disrespect us and we will still vote for them above Labor. Uh, and the only thing that's going to change that that insult and that dis- disrespect, disregard for our, our constituency is when we actually stop that promise, when we actually say, look, if, if there is a better Labor candidate and any better candidate, we're actually going to not vote on party lines. We're always going to vote on a honest assessment of the candidates, not the overall party, but what does this candidate say? There's a huge difference between Tony Abbott, Scott Morrison and Malcolm Turnbull, but they're all from the same party. It's just ignorant to think 
that a liberal candidate is going to have liberal values. Uh, well, those are powerful sentiments. I'm going to bring Rob Norman in here. Uh, when we think of the major parties uh, and what a powerful image that is, uh, they will spit on Christians with the assumption that they will continue to vote for them no matter what. Uh, Rob Norman, what are your thoughts when you hear that sort of imagery? Because I think a lot of people will say, you know what? That's exactly right. That's the way things are happening. I've come to appreciate Dave Pellow's imagery. We spent a lot of time together, and I (laughs) I totally agree with where he's coming from. Uh, Look, I think also the electorate is up to this. So we're seeing a late swing in the polls. I don't know how that's going to transfer. We're not profits in that respect. But um, the people that have stood their ground in this abortion debate are the ones that are now reaping the dividends. Yes. And I think we're going to see that more and more. That won't the media won't report that. Vision Radio will because you guys are on to it. But the bottom line is we're we're beginning to see in Townsville at the moment two seats at risk because the LNP have ducked and dived the issue. And and I believe partly at least the catters have stood up and said, here's where we stand. I would have been very happy had uh, Mr Christofulli agree with the uh, maybe go to the electorate and say, look, we don't have a policy, we're not, we're not making this a priority, but we will give our MPs a conscience vote. That's what we've always done. Now, he may have taken a hit. I suspect he would have been in a much better position on Friday the 25th of October than had he been uh, doing what he's done now where the polls have tightened. Catters, perhaps moving into a place of significant prominence, uh, if what you say is true, and uh, because they've stood their ground, people say, I respect that, and I'm glad they're doing that, and there's some support that's going to come in behind. Perhaps that might be the same too for Family First, uh, even uh, to One Nation. Uh, What are your thoughts here, Dave Pellow, about standing your ground and uh, winning some level of support and respect? Look, the the thing I'm encouraged by, and just about jumping and clicking my heels and shouting, yee-haw, praise the Lord, is that I am seeing a trend over decades Uh, which is our friend, which is super encouraging. I've just come back from a conference in Adelaide where there was heartbreaking nearness of loss uh, in a pro-life bill there. We lost by one vote and, and the emotions are running high and the, the, the devastation for the local battlers, the local crusaders for justice, for the sanctity of life. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking for me to, to go and visit them and, and watch and commiserate with them. I went into Parliament, went here and there. But um, what, I, what I encourage them with, and, and everybody in the conference praised God, because what we're seeing is a shift in the conversation. It's called the Overton Window of Acceptable Discourse. We are getting closer and closer and closer to the day, just like William Wilberforce achieved with his generation of grassroots Christian activists who actually made the justice issue the election issue. They mocked him at first, then they were super angry with him, and then it was an election issue. And then the parliament was full of people who said, no, you may not treat living humans as disposable private property. That is not okay in slavery. It is not okay in pre-born child sacrifice. Uh, It is not... We are seeing that this election, it has become a major issue. And as Rob said, we're seeing that it is prospering. It is the parties and candidates who are pro-life and proudly pro-life who are prospering and doing better than those who are cowards on the issue. Uh, and, And this is something to encourage every listener with, if not this election, if not the election after, be faithful. The outcomes are God's. Obedience is ours. Uh, we are getting there, and my generation will end abortion. We're going to take a short break, and coming back with Rob Norman, the ACL State Director for Queensland. Uh, we're also uh, with Mike Southon from Freedom for Faith and Dave Pellow from Church and State Summits, back with more in just a few moments. Hi, Aiden here, and each week on Songs That Change You, I'm joined by a guest to discuss a song that has had a significant impact on their life and journey with God. I was running from God, and He met me on the side of the road. I had nothing to give Him, and so when I hear this song, I feel that. You know what it's like to meet your baby for the first time? It just felt like 
home and I didn't know I just didn't know that I could feel like that for another human being and somehow this song captured that experience so well. Songs that changed you every weekend right after 20 the Countdown magazine and on demand in the free Vision Christian Media app. Persecution of Christians often rob families of their fathers and mothers when they are imprisoned or martyred for Christ. Station sponsor Voice of the Martyrs has been providing support to meet the physical, spiritual and educational needs of victims of Christians' persecution for over 50 years. Your tax-deductible donation will make a significant difference in the lives of the families of Christian prisoners and martyrs who can't survive without your assistance. For more information and to partner with Voice of the Martyrs, visit vom.com.au. Vision. It's a special day today. It is the uh, the day before Queenslanders are off to the polls. The Queensland state election tomorrow. Lots of Queenslanders have already voted. Uh, three guests with us on our panel for this hour. Rob Norman from the Australian Christian Lobby. He's the state director for Queensland. Uh, we're also with Dave Pello from the Church and State Summits and Mike Southon, who leads Freedom for Faith. Let me ask you, gentlemen, about outcomes, uh, the likely prospects of how things will look after the polls close tomorrow evening at six in Queensland. Uh, counting will begin. Uh, will it be a quick result? Uh, the likelihood is it perhaps will be if the swings are as big as what people are predicting. But let me ask you, Mike Southon, what are you thinking about outcomes for the Queensland state election tomorrow? Um to be honest, the polls are starting to, to look all over the place, uh, and it will be interesting to see. I, I'm, I'm still betting on a, a, a Liberal majority government. I, I can't see Labor putting together a majority government uh, in any way, but they could try to put together a coalition with the Greens. But otherwise, if it comes very close, we could be looking at a Liberal government that is in partnership with the Catters, uh, and that would be a, quite an interesting uh, combination. Rob Norman, you've been watching polls changing too. Uh, things are tightening, uh, uh, you know, just ahead of the election. Um, people have been speculating about a landslide victory for the LNP. That may not happen. Any thoughts from you? Yeah, I was probably in that camp, and I think um, I think they had the golden opportunity to do that and uh, ducking and weaving and, and jumping around all over the place in the last couple of weeks has probably forfeited that. Uh, so I think Mike's assessed things right. I think we'll probably still see a majority LNP government. Um, that would be my tip. Um, and the second most likely would be a, a Catter minority government with the Catters. Dave Pello, um, what would it look like uh, if there is a hung parliament, uh, there's a reliance on a, now a crossbench, uh, Catters, uh, to maintain their three seats in Queensland. Uh, there's one, one nation seat, another one independent. What if there was a hung parliament? What would that look like? Uh, how would that be from these sorts of Christian, moral, uh, ethics-based things that we often talk about? Because Queensland has no upper house... Uh, we have a unicameral government. Uh, we essentially have four-year elected dictatorships where the right. government can do anything they want, uh, however obscene and extreme they want, uh, for four years. Um, the sad thing is the LNP government will very, very rarely wind the extremities of a Labor government back. They'll just really keep the seat warm until Labor's next turn. So the best hope for Queensland residents, all five and a half million of us, is that we have a minority government, that we have a government that goes very slowly, is bogged down and can do very little, and we have a conservative Christian conscience uh, or as close to it as possible crossbench. Those people in a minority uh, party such as Catters or Independence or Family First or One Nation Candidates who will say no to the LNP government. Uh, and that's why voting for minor parties is incredibly important uh, anywhere, but especially in Queensland, because what we need is the biggest crossbench possible and not filled with greens or, or, or fringe nutters like them, but actual um, right-thinking people um, who will actually live that most Australian sentiment in enshrined in our constitution, humbly relying on the blessings of Almighty God. If we have a crossbench of humble um, minority representatives not belonging to either major party, 
that is the best hope possible for freedom of religion, for sanctity of life, for shutting down the obscene gender clinic in the children's hospital uh, and the other issues of, of critical justice and liberty in this state. Hey, Rob Norman, have you been monitoring any of the other minor parties? We're talking about Christian minor parties, um, but, you know, the Teals, uh, you know, there's been some reports about what they're doing in campaigning in Queensland or uh, the pro-cannabis uh, type parties. Uh, have you been monitoring any of these other groups and how they are feeling? Are they feeling buoyant uh, in this time? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a buoyancy. Um the Cannabis Party, interestingly, were one of the highest respondents to our uh, to our questionnaire. And if you go through the questionnaires, you're probably going to think these guys look like Christians. And I think some of them are, to be honest. I think, uh, you know, I've had discussion with some that come along that way. I think the other seat that uh, we need to look at is the seat of Keppel. This is an interesting one. So uh, James Ashby, the um, chief of staff mm. to Pauline Hanson, is running in that seat showing some very strong results. He's coming out very strongly pro-life in terms of particularly third trimester abortions. He wants to, he's openly said that he would like to see a review of the Termination of Pregnancy Act. And from all reports, it's doing him no damage electorally. And this should be a real lesson to the major parties. Uh, Mike, if I come back to you, uh, so far as whether things look messy if there is a hung parliament in Queensland and if there is going to be a crossbench that actually has some power and some sway, uh, sometimes people think, oh, I don't want it to be too messy. I mean, I've had enough of politics, but actually messy is good, isn't it? Yeah, and Queensland's the only state that isn't messy. Um, pretty much every state and our federal government have to deal with um, uh, not having a majority in their upper house. And that does usually mean that there is, there is trading, there is discussion, uh, and you don't have, I, I, I loved Dave's phrase, a, a four-year dictatorship that Queensland has. So messy in most cases is good because dialogue is good. Having mm. a nuanced, reasonable conversation about these issues is good without one side being called baby killers and the other side being called anti-women or whatever. Um, we need to actually be able to sit down and say, hey, what is going on here? What are the numbers? What are the statistics? And that only happens when there are people who hold the balance of power who are starting to ask those questions. Uh, let me ask you, Dave Pello, a worst case scenario when we're talking about uh, Christian issues, uh, those sorts of ethical, moral issues that uh, we're bringing to the fore and saying these things uh, do not exalt a nation. Uh, what if there is a minority government uh, from the Labor Party and they team up with the Greens? Uh, worst case scenario, uh, what do you think Queensland will look like if that is the outcome tomorrow? Oh, look, um it's uh, part of. Uh, there's so many conflicted feelings about this because, uh, you know, the worst case scenario is possibly the wake up call the church needs. Uh, persecution and and lack of freedom. Uh, you know where where the the things that happen um, are so outrageous and unimaginable that people finally start to take notice and understand that their silence and their apathy is is fueling the slow and steady destruction of the justice liberty and peace of of their neighbors um the the greens and and labor party getting in government look we'll see an acceleration of it and and maybe th I'm trying to be objective here. Maybe that's not the worst case scenario. Maybe it's better to rip the bandaid off and destroy our nation um, with a radical leftist government. So it happens in one decade instead of one generation, uh, and then we can get on about the repair job. I'd love to get on with the repair job today, but I just don't know that there are enough Christians awake preaching repentance and righteousness and advocating for justice in the public square uh, for us to do it. A, a safer, paler, more benign government, more beige government may just keep us asleep in a way that allows the slow destruction of our children and health and economy 
to continue unabated in the wrong direction for far too long. Mike Southon, uh, perhaps there'd be some listening who are thinking that uh, Christians always lean towards the conservative side and uh, usually conservatives tend to have some form of alignment with some of our uh, common Christian values. When you've got a conservative side that is not putting its hand up to say anything they could be accountable for much after an election, uh, I wonder if you've got any thoughts here. I mean, ripping a Band-Aid off. Um, I mean, that's something that is is quite confronting for listeners to hear when Dave Pellow says that. Uh, what are your thoughts here, uh, Mike? <laughs> Well, I mean, the first thing I thought of when David was talking about ripping the Band-Aid off is God is in control, not yeah. us. Yeah. And God is going to give us the government that he wants us to have to drive us in the direction he wants us to go in. Uh, and if God has decided that now is the time for serious persecution of Christians, that's what's going to happen. Um, however, um, understanding God's control and his sovereignty is not fatalism either. So um, just as I do with evangelism, I know only God saves people, but I'm going to work as hard as I can Good. to save souls. Uh, exactly the same way with politics. God is in control, but I'm going to go down fighting. Right. Um, and so, um, but Dave said it earlier as well, um, that there is an assumption that Christians vote on the conservative side. And I think that is an extremely dangerous assumption. It's dangerous for political parties. Um, I think it's um, dangerous when the Labour Party assumes that Christians won't vote for them because they actually forego pursuing a set of votes that in many cases actually are winnable. Um, as shown in New South Wales, New South Wales government learnt that when you actually act a little bit more sensibly on some of these issues, you actually can win in, in heavily Christian Western Sydney. Um, so it's dangerous for them, and we've also seen it's dangerous for the Liberal Party to assume that they have our vote, because, as Dave said, they, they just ignore us completely. Well, you're going to vote for us. We don't care. We're going to go um, pursue other people's votes. But it's most dangerous, I want to say, for Christians, because we become voiceless if it's assumed. So the thing we have to do, as David said at the very start, is we have to break this assumption of, that both parties have of how we're going to vote. And the only way we can do that is by using our voices, by standing up and saying, hey, these are issues that we care about, and we actually are going to swing on, on to the parties who are going to stand up for this range of Christian issues, both social justice and religious freedom and you know the unborn and everything else. Well, for listeners, and we've run out of time with our special guests today on this special preview, but you can get to know the party that you will vote for tomorrow. You can get to know the candidates who are going to be standing in your local electorate. You might not have met them personally, but there is research that you can access, and it will be trustworthy research from the Australian Christian Lobby. Let me give you a number of different websites where you can access some good resource right now to help you understand how you vote. QLDVotes.org.au That's the special website for the Queensland state election that's been set up by the Australian Christian Lobby it has details about the parties and even about the candidates how they've voted uh, over uh, this last term of, of, uh, of government QLDVotes.org.au You can also uh, access FamilyFirstParty.org.au uh, They're the ones that scored 100% on the Australian Christian Valley Values Checklist So you might be thinking Well what sort of policies do they have That I might use as a foundation For judging what other policies are on offer I want to point you also to FreedomForFaith.org.au that's the organisation that Mike Southon leads and uh, there'll be information there about what's going on in the state of Queensland as well as what's going on in states around Australia and uh, I might say keep an eye on the freedomforfaith.org.au website too uh, with a federal election coming early next year. And I mentioned the, Queen, the, the Queensland uh, Australian Christian Values Checklist. You can find that at christianvalues.org.au. And uh, while not with us today, I did have an update yesterday with Family Voice Australia, and they've got a number of resources on their website too, at familyvoice.org.au. So there are lots of resources 
uh, access some of those and help that inform the way that you'll approach the vote for tomorrow's Queensland state election. I want to say a special thank you to the guests that have been part of our program today. Rob Norman, the ACL State Director for Queensland. Rob, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Neil. Great to be with you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Mike. Mike Southon from Freedom for Faith. Mike, thank you. Thanks, no, thanks everyone. It's been a great chat. And Dave Pello, the founder of the Church and State Summits. Uh, Dave, thank you. Thank you, Neil, and Vision Radio and everyone. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.